psychology with us. And we also have uh, with us uh, Uni, who will be again summarizing it. And with this purpose, we have had this webinar. I'm sure that this uh, webinar will be very useful. Maybe after the presentation of one, we can have a, a short question answer. And the second, we'll have a short question answer. Then uh, Uni will try to uh, sum up this entire uh, um, points that we have discussed today. So now I will uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Matthew uh, to uh, start your presentation. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumar Karim. And uh, I would like also to thank Dr. Uni and uh, Nicholas for the discussions we had before these uh, webinars and for inviting them. Um, creating the opportunity um, we'll just see the presentation to start. So basically the, the topic of my talk would be uh, quite simple. It would be looking at uh, ethnobotany through the lens of anthropology. Just the idea here would be trying to see what kind of uh, insights, perspectives uh, could bring anthrop uh, anthropology when we do economics, basically. So some of the elements that we talk about it, uh, certainly seems obvious to some of you. Of course, because we are talking about future knowledge and so on. So many of you may be aware of that. But I think it, it's good also to put the things uh, down and look at uh, what's happening. So, we will go back to the first one. They're not, they're not able to just so maybe can do it. Yes. Okay. All right. Now we can start. Can you so, hear now? Is it okay? Can you can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's good. Okay. So as a short introduction to this topic, um, just a little sketch about the history of ethnobotany and anthropology. And from the beginning, actually, the two were just working together. No? Um, ethnobotany has multiple roots, okay, coming from the expeditions of explorers in colonial times and so on, this kind of uh, things. But the relations with anthropology was very strong uh, from the beginning, okay? Just one uh, example uh, coming from France, uh, one of the founders of the ethnography in France was uh, Marcel Mauss in the beginning of the 20th century. And he wrote an uh, ethnography manual, which was for the, his students who were about to go to the field and document different communities around mostly uh, colony, French colonies. Okay? And in this ethnography manual, he is just listing that, um, documenting the use of plants in uh, agriculture, in uh, collection, gathering, is a key component of the description of society. So ethnobotany was just part of the ethnography. Here, another example, it's from the Dakar Djibouti expeditions, uh, which was organized by a French anthropologists at this time to document the French colonies in Africa. Okay, so they crossed uh, Northern Africa uh, with cars and so on. And here, interestingly, what they did was actually also documenting a lot of uh, ethnobotan uh, ethnobotanical uh, elements. Okay, so doc documenting plants, trees, uh, and also animals. I mean, ethnobotany and ethnobotanical were working together. Another big step when we look at the relations between ethnobotany and anthropology is the work of uh, Harold Conklin. You may know of him. He's, uh, it's one of the most uh, detailed studies in ethnobotany. Um, that he did uh, in the Philippines with the Anuno people. And it was the first uh, actually detailed and we could say even complete um, study in ethnobotany that documented the use of plants, the meanings of plants, the names, what names, and so on. 
So it was kind of a turning point because uh, with this study, Conklin showed that contrary really to what people were saying before that, the local knowledge systems are organized, rational, logical, efficient, and so on. No? So it was kind of a change when uh, we did this study, and it inspired a lot of people after that. No? So another important point, uh, um, moment in this history is the what we call the cognitive turn or the use of cognitive anthropology and the the big use of ethnobotany that these people made okay so there the idea was not to document the use of plants and names and so on but to look at the way people were thinking and organizing the natural uh, environment no so the one UK uh, researcher there is Brent Berlin, of course, who has been uh, looking at the system of classification of uh, local people. So in Mexico, mostly, but there have been studies also in Amazonia. And the idea there was to look at the principles that were organizing the local classifications. Okay, And one of the very interesting results there is the work of uh, Scott Atron. In 1990, uh, which showed that local classifications of plants, animals, and so on are actually displaying the same kind of organizing principles than the linear classification that Western scientists were using. Okay, so he showed that actually to some of the principles to classify, to put hierarchy between taxa, you know, in a classification of plants or animals would be quite similar from one classification system to the other. So here it's very interesting because it shows that kind of how ethnobotany has been really efficient for anthropology and theoretical anthropological research. No, it was like uh, it's a um, common feeding uh, movement between the two. So now I go about like more general reflection about how we can think about anthropology and botany along several lines. Okay, uh, we cannot discuss about everything because it's so rich and we could discuss during days about the relations between the two. But I, I try to focus on some specific points. Um, <clears throat> so the idea would be to say, okay, we have numbers. We do uh, ethnobotic ethnobotanical survey. So, but what is hiding behind these numbers? How do you understand what is going on? And when, what kind of processes of dynamics are going on behind? Okay. Anthropology, if we uh, define it like or summarize uh, very roughly like the main thematics or the main uh, study point of this discipline, we mostly focus on meanings in what people, uh, what kind of meaning people give to their actions, to the actions of others, interpretation, and so on. Okay, what kind of meaning they will give to some plants, to some animals, and my behavior, whatever. A second big dimension that social anthropology studies is social organization, the social relations. What makes a social group live together, and what kind of interaction it is. The another one is power relations politics, okay? What happens in a village? Who has power over someone, et cetera, et cetera. And the, sorry, and the last one is the symbolic ritual religious dimension, okay, which is also very important. So <clears throat> I look at three main dimensions. The first one would be the epistemology okay, of knowledge. So what means knowing? When you do a survey with people, what when people say, oh, I know this term, what does it mean actually? Okay. So in anthropology, there is a quite a rich tradition about looking at this question. And <clears throat> some of the main insights have been that okay, empirical perspective is not the only one that people may use, okay, like trial and error and so on. This is the most common way of learning that we think about, okay, when we see people talking about plants and so on. But <clears throat> this is not the only way along which 
knowledge will be uh, considered as valid or as the truth by one community or some people. Okay, there may be some different ways of considering the knowledge as valid, such as, for example, the religious side. Some people in some areas, for example, you will have uh, specific uh, specialist knowledge, which is uh, held by ritual specialists. Okay? And their knowledge is seen as valid because it comes from God, or because it has been given by some um, supernatural entities or this kind of things. So if the same knowledge would be, um, say, uh, let's say, collected with someone else, the, this knowledge will not be considered as valid because it doesn't come from uh, the right entity or this kind of thing. The second uh, point here is that there is very different ways of knowing. Okay? Uh, knowing the name of a plant that you will collect in a free listing, for example, is not the same thing as knowing how to use it, to be able to recognize it, and so on. Okay, So this is quite uh, obvious uh, point. But it's important when you try to understand how uh, learning happens in one society, and so on. Okay? Because a child, for example, can listen to the name of a plant, so he knows the name of a plant, but he doesn't know how to use it, he doesn't know what kind of benefits it can do, and so on. And so another one, uh, another point is to say that not everyone is socially eligible for knowing. This point is maybe not so obvious, but uh, it comes, uh, I'll give you one example. So in some uh, societies, um, they, you have kind of a specialist knowledge, okay? So someone who is not initiated, for example, will not be uh, considered as someone who can know about that, okay? So when I did my PhD, this is an example from Africa. I, I did a field work in Western Cameroon. It's an area where you have a lot of kingdoms, small kingdoms, uh, small size but a very hierarchical society, okay, with different ranks, uh, high status people, and uh, first of all would be the king, and then there is uh, nobiliary uh, people, and so on, okay. So in these uh, societies, you will have also a kind of um, organization of knowledge between initiated people and non-initiated. So I was very confused in the beginning in doing this fieldwork because I was asking to people, I knew they knew something, but they were telling me, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. And at the end, one explained me and he said, I'm not part of this uh, society linked to the palace, so I'm not initiated. So I cannot know. I'm not supposed to know. Of course, I know the name of this plant and how people use it, but I'm not supposed to know. Okay. So this is a quite important thing to, to keep in mind, I said, uh, when looking at. The use of plants, particularly when you have some ritual dimension uh, involved. So, wait. Okay. So, here is an example of a secret society on the left and a protection ritual on the, on the right. And it is typically, typically the, the kind of uh, knowledge that people use to do these uh, rituals is related to secret plants and so on. So, not everybody knows what they are supposed to know. Okay, the second dimension I would like to talk about is learning and transmission. Okay, um, there is of course many ways of learning, of transmitting knowledge. First difference would be between what is written, what is oral. Okay, it's obvious uh, when you look at Ayurveda or Siddha tradition, some written things. So it is for the maintenance of knowledge. So if you have some time. another way of learning is imitation, trial and error, and also roving knowledge. There have been some very interesting studies in anthropology made on the way people were learning uh, to do some specific crafts, okay? And in some uh, situations, the, the students will not learn directly from the teacher, okay, from the, the, so the master, for example, but he will have to steal the knowledge. So to observe, to stay hidden, to be able to do some specific tasks uh, related to this kind of craft they are learning. 
So it's also a way of learning, no? Robbie, you know. Here is an example uh, from my fieldwork in Gujarat with the Rabari community. It's a kid with a goat. So his parents are not telling him, you know, to deal with the goat, you have to do that, you have to do that. They give him a goat with a rope and say, you take care of her mm. during two hours. And he has to learn mm. what he will learn with experience, no? So he was fighting with her because she didn't want to, to move and this kind of thing. It's a way of learning and so um, <clears throat> Another way of looking at transmission patterns would be to use the Cavalis Forza model. I don't know if you know about this. He proposed um, kind of a, yeah, part, so a sim simplified ways of uh, transmitting knowledge. So one is vertical, one is horizontal, one is one to many, and the other one is many to one. And you can also uh, add like the peer, between peer knowledge, so it's horizontal uh, transmission of knowledge. So here, um, I think some interesting questions are raised for ethnobotany. When you look a little bit at the patterns of transmission learning, that for example, when you do an ethnobot ethnobotanical survey with one community, there will be a written record, probably, of this uh, of the knowledge you document, okay? And then it will have an impact, uh, probably, on the dynamics of transmission of knowledge, no? Because the next generation would be able to refer to this written record of knowledge and so on. So it is something that could be taken into account. Um, <clears throat> okay, I just skip and go to the next. Okay, uh, this one, it's maybe the most important, but most obvious. Uh, it's looking at the social organization of um, community of a group of a village, okay? Um, because you will see in uh, many uh, works, uh, research in ethnobotany, but not only, that people assume that, okay, this community, they are associated with this livelihood. For example, the Rabari, okay, there are shepherds. So everybody is supposed to know about shepherding, okay? It's like putting a kind of a big name or big quality on a community and then assuming that it is homogeneous. But um, it's uh, obvious that you will have a lot of differences between individuals in one uh, specific setting. There are many factors that will shape the access to knowledge and so on. So, one is the specialization. With plants, you will always find some specialists. Can be related to rituals, some uh, Guruji, some uh, Pujari, whatever, no? Some people who know about specific plants and so on. And then you have the non-initiated people who know about other plants. Okay, it's one thing. The other one is, uh, of course, like all the social factors that you may take into account gender, because very often you have a labor division, okay, between men and women, obviously, so people will not know the same. Age groups, and what is not often taken into account is about kinship and residence group. You know, like families, extended families, have an impact on the transmission of knowledge. So sometimes you have differences in the same village with people having the same occupation, between families, because inside of the family, some specific use, knowledge, etc., are transmitted. Okay, so you will have some <coughs> emerging uh, bodies of knowledge according to kinship groups, and I will show you an example. And also, um, one thing is to to see what is favoring transmission of knowledge, but what is, another is to look at what is impeding. Uh, knowledge flow, okay? So we talk in anthropology about social barriers, which are like the things that, that make people not talking, not exchanging between themselves, okay? For example, one typical would be the caste, uh, <coughs> like uh, in, in some communities, no? there will be a barrier and so on. Okay, one classical study about that is a study by Boster, James Boster. Uh, he was one student of Van Berlin. He did a very interesting um, 
study with the cultivation of cassava, uh, with one population of Jivaro Aguaruna in Amazonia, okay, in Bolivia, I said. And he used uh, identification tests, okay, so he planted uh, two different gardens, test gardens, one with 64, the 64 varieties that were identified by people, 64, okay, different, and one with only the 12 most common, uh, most cited uh, local species. Now. And so he asked to all the people in the village to go through and to give the names of every type, okay, every type, of every specimen that they get. And he analyzed this data afterwards uh, using cultural consensus analysis. I don't know if you know it, it's a way of it's a quantitative analysis, uh, looking at the similarities between people. So what he showed with this study uh, that there is a difference between men and women, okay? May seem obvious because mostly women, I think, were involved in uh, cassava cultivation. You have difference between women according to age, and so, so old women will know better than young women, okay? But also he showed that uh, there is difference between residence groups and kinship groups, meaning women living in the same uh, neighborhood will know more the same, okay, about the varieties and so on. So it's one way to look at that. Um, the other one is an example from my own uh, work in uh, Gujarat. So with the Abari community, I was talking just before. Um, so in this case, it's quite interesting. So it's, um, let's say it's a community which is in a transition because um, animal keeping has been a specialty of this uh, caste. It's a caste actually uh, before, and they are famous in, uh, in Rajasthan. They are called the Raika. They are famous for camel herding, for example. Okay. So, but uh, the livelihood has changed a lot in the last uh, decades, even century, you could say. So, to nowadays, you have um, maybe 20% of the people who are still involved in uh, nomadic mobile uh, sheep keeping. Okay. And the other members of the community are sedentarized, doing farming, driving, and other variation numbers. Here uh, in blue, you will see the number of people who are becoming sedentary, and you see that the trend is quite strong. No? It was in one village. And down uh, on the figure down, uh, at the bottom, you will see like the new livelihood that people do when they sedentarize. So you see that some are still involved in animal keeping, but it will be different, like cows, buffaloes, for example. But some also do labor, uh, of course, uh, night guards, uh, security guards, and so so I've been working mostly with the mobile people, okay, uh, the ones still involved in ship keeping, and they they are we could say almost purely nomadic, like they move uh, almost all the year. Okay, they only spend one month close to their village during monsoon, but otherwise they are moving all across uh, Gujarat. So <clears throat> when they move, shall I go? No, I'll go back. When they move, uh, they are organized in migration groups, which gather several households. Okay, so you will have two, three, four, five, seven, ten different households together. Each household has each family has one uh, flock, one herd of animals. Okay, and they go together. So they go together because they save money, they do the scale economy uh, question, but also because they can help each other and they can resist two external treats to the group. Okay. Sometimes some thieves are coming to get some sheep. So if there are 10 families, they can defend themselves better. Okay. But the interesting thing is that this collective group, this collective uh, life, social life, is the main basis for knowledge transmission in this community of shepherds. Okay. From an external point of view, you could look at them and think, oh, the Havari are shepherds, so knowledge must be more or less the same no, for everybody. But in fact, when you look at how they live, so there is one migration group. It, people live together during all the year. No? There are 20 people. They share everything. They live together all the year. So they share knowledge, and they learn together. You take a different group, it will be the same. They live together and they stay together. 
And the, the groups are stable from one year to the other, which means people, sometimes some people will stay during 20 years migrating with the same uh, friends, colleagues, and so on, okay? So it is one of the basis of knowledge transmission. Um, the, these groups are mostly based on kinship relations. So it will be three brothers and some in-laws, and they will get together, and they will stay together to migrate, okay? So there is trust and so on, there is an issue. Um, I'll go quickly on the details, but we did a study on four domains of uh, traditional knowledge, okay? One was about soil categories, because they have specific terms to talk about soils, okay? Salty, sweet, and so on. One was about the tado, tado cauterization, which is a ethno-veterinary practice. No? They burn the skin of the animals with an iron rod, and they do specific patterns and so on. So we were we asked a question about if there is this kind of ailment in your animal, what kind of pattern you design, where do you burn, and so on. So and we saw a lot of differences actually between our groups. Uh, another domain was the breeds of sheep. So what are the name of the main breeds and what are the characteristics associated with them and so on. Another one was ethnobotanical knowledge. So we took the 10, 10 or 12 um, quite common plants in this area in Gujarat, in Western Gujarat actually, and uh, asking questions about the use of these plants, okay? So, and we compare the answers of people in these four domains knowledge to see what kind of uh, variations were observed and so on. So this is part of the result um, here. So there are differences between men and women um, only in one domain. It's about breeds. Here we cannot see which one I think is the first one. And we third one more anyway. Um, <clears throat> Another interesting result that what, there is a strong association between engagement in the activity, meaning the, the fact that people have been uh, shepherd, have been keeping animals for real no? for some years. And so it is related with two domains of knowledge, meaning the people who are not anymore involved in the activity don't have, have much less knowledge about this. And one, um, one interesting trend also was that the, um, we observed that some people had been shepherd for five years, 10 years, and they quit 10 years ago, but they were still knowing almost like current uh, people currently involved in shepherding. Right? So there it was showing that, okay, people, uh, as long as people have been engaged in the activity, the knowledge would tend to remain with them. That was also one. Okay, so this is like um, in cheap uh, diagrams to explain like the organization of migration group. So you, it would be in a, what we call a segment of lineage, okay? Meaning uh, the family, the extended family following the paternal line, for example, in this case. This is, so you will see like cousins uh, migrating to the Okay, and this is the result of the quantitative uh, analysis we did on these four uh, domains of knowledge, on the answers and so on. And so you'll see that uh, where the significant uh, the stars are appearing, the first row, so it's for the migration groups, showing that the migration groups is a key factor to explain the difference between in two domains, no? soils, shadow, a little bit for that. We also used social network analysis, but I will not talk about this uh, here, but it was a way also to map um, social groups, okay, with a different, in a different way. Okay, so now we go, we reached a kind of a conclusion over here for the end of this talk. Um, so anthropology and ethnobotany definitely have some rich dialogue to conduct, and they are actually uh, the relations exchanges are ongoing. A lot of researchers doing that, uh, but I think it can also be uh, increased again, and so on. 
um, particularly because nowadays that we have this uh, global environmental change issue, okay, uh, climate change, but ecosystem change, land use change, whatever. Um, <clears throat> the knowledge systems and the practice of people are changing also very fast sometimes, and the ecosystems are changing very fast. So um, ethnobotany is very well situated because you can document how people are reacting kind of to the changes in the ecosystems and so on. So I think it's an um, important contribution that the ethnobotany could do and anthropology could also help. Uh, I have one example from Gujarat again. Uh, so Prosopis juliflora, I don't know, you may know about it. It's an uh, invasive uh, mimosa tree, uh, which has spread in many parts of India. Uh, so it was introduced in the 50s, 60s in Gujarat and in what is now Pakistan, I think, before by the British. So <clears throat> it is everywhere in uh, Western Gujarat, in touch. Okay. But uh, people have learned to use it and to avoid it. And so on. So we did some survey dedicated to understand how people use the piece nowadays. Because uh, first sight, people say oh, it's a lot of problems, and but people also use it. So we did we documented no, the use of these new plants. And interestingly, there were some uh, medical uh, use mentioned about this plant. So people were saying, uh, we use the leaves, we mix it with jaggery, for example, and we paste it when we have some scratches on this kind of things. Uh, so it's, and this is new uses actually, because uh, it was spreading in this area only since the 60s, 70s. Okay. So people are learning now to use new plants. It's uh, an example. <clears throat> Another um, big question is the relation between scientific and indigenous knowledge. Uh, we all know about that, no? uh, but the debate is still going on. Uh, there have been some uh, very interesting initiatives with institutions like the IGBUS, for example, where traditional knowledge is integrated, indigenous people are integrated in the process of reporting synthesis. But uh, it's going on no? a lot of uh, Another one, is, it's also related to this first uh, point, but the politics of knowledge, okay, what, are, what means knowing for people and for their power, for their position, and uh, for the relations between people. When I know uh, some people say knowledge is power, but actually in some cases it is the case. Huh? Uh, and, uh, protecting knowledge, sharing knowledge, all this is related to politics. And then uh, another very important dimension would be the ethics uh, question. Like, there have been a lot of progress when you look at the 50s, 1950s, and the way people were doing field work. There have been a lot of progress. You have to acknowledge that uh, about how you engage with the local community and how do you protect their rights, uh, their intellectual rights, and the sharing of benefits, and so on. So it's also a question where uh, dialogue between anthropology and ethnobotany is very rich. Okay, and that, that's it for this. Uh, uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, before taking questions, we'll go to the next presentation and then we'll take questions. Sure, sure. Yeah, because you can just uh, start. Yeah. And then I can just change it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> We'll go to the next presentation. Uh, yes. Meanwhile, Dr. Nicholas can introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. First, I would like to thank Dr. Karim here for, for making and organizing this. Uh, this mm -hmm. seminar as well. Uh, for, yeah, for making this uh, webinar possible in a very short period of time, indeed. I'd like to thank Suni also, I saw he's there uh, attending the, the, the session. Uh, thanks to my colleague Mathieu, indeed, for his uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, I'm also an anthropologist, I have got some interest in ethnobotany as well, and I must say I could not present uh, much better the links between anthropology and ethnobotany, even the, the roots of ethnobotany, which was indeed in part of the uh, anthropological uh, and especially ethnographic 
uh, immersion of uh, researcher within local population and plants were really uh, present, part, part of the ethnography. So just based on what he has just presented, uh, what I will do, I will try to, to, to even extend uh, the link between anthropology and ethnobotany by shifting to uh, ethnoveterinary and even by adding and challenging uh, uh, an essential component that I just uh, I'm working on in my, in my research is the, the, um, the animal knowledge. So what, what should be the role of animal knowledge in the constitution of co-production of, medicinal, of a medicinal human-animal system of knowledge? So this is a very uh, challenging question. And so my intervention today, today will be more uh, based, based on case study. Uh, it will be based on the, on the, uh, on the research, uh, on the two years project I conducted in, uh, in Laos uh, among the Thai Le community and their relation with, uh, with elephant. And my, my main intention was uh, actually to reflect uh, on, the, on the links between environment and health or with, and with uh, biodiversity and cultural uh, uh, diversity. So I will, uh, what I will do is that I will just uh, present uh, a bit of this uh, field work, this specific approach as well, uh, before presenting some uh, results and, and hoping to, uh, to launch a uh, uh, discussion on all those things. Uh, so I should move. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. So no. First, I, I initially started uh, conducting on ethnographic studies and on the practices and medicine of, and care on uh, working elephants uh, in uh, in uh, northwestern Laos as part of uh, an. Um, anthropological project on the pathogen. And initially I was interested about the local perception of uh, elephant disease and in particular elephant tuberculosis. That was an emergency, uh, emergent uh, zoonosis, actually a reverse zoonosis because it comes from human to the elephant or via uh, the, the cow, or buffalo or bovine and etc. And when I start uh, uh, conducting this, uh, this research on the local perception of the, on the disease, and I was also had a uh, particular interest on the prevention and so that the veterinary practices by the, by the locals. But my, my informants, the, the local Mahout, they uh, straight um, point me that uh, um, they insist to me that the, the, the elephant actually have their own knowledge. Uh, about the forest, which they express by searching for specific specimen and part of plants, uh, barks, leaves, or roots. So that is to say that uh, locally, if the, if the mahout are aware that uh, they provide necessary plants for healthy diet of, of elephant, then they know that the elephant will uh, supplement this diet by themselves. And indeed, by uh, conducting my research and while working and traveling in each other company, Elephant will draw on a diverse and abundance of vegetation. They encounter across a variety of space. In villages, uh, indeed, mahout and elephant do not claim to control on all aspects of the animal uh, feeding and care. And even for them, they told me that the forest is the equivalent of the pharmacy, the hankanya in, uh, in, uh, in Laos, where elephant can choose and select uh, medicine on their own. And so and when indeed an elephant uh, appears to be sick, the mahout or the owner will voluntarily leave the animal uh, alone in the forest for a few days so that he will become a sabai, uh, healthy again. So this means, uh, and for my uh, research, it means that from a local standpoint, uh, my ethno-veterinary anal analysis of the thing is like this number of the Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry uh, Nicole, slides are not visible. Yeah, Can yeah, you please yeah. correct it? Yeah, yes, thank sir. you. After this slide sharing, I Now it's fine. Is it now okay? It's not a good one. No, not yet. No, please uh, share again. Stop sharing now. Again, you go on with the. Yeah. Hmm. Now we go.
Yeah. Please put on full screen mode. Thank you. Fine, fine. So, uh, so I, I won't repeat, and I will just uh, get back to the point. But what what the Mahout uh, informed me at the very beginning of my of my research uh, means that yet from the lo local standpoint, my veterinary analysis of practices of health and care for elephants in this region must include an additional and essential non-human element. That is the respect for the knowledge of the elephants themselves and their capacity for self-medication. And then the scope of my uh, of my project was expanded to to look at the diet of elephant. And at that time, I was uh, then thinking and searching for any possible converging utilization of plants up between human and animals. So for data so for data collection, I I um, I mobilized two main methods. First is the ethnographic tool, and uh, Mathieu has already uh, talked about. But it, that means the immersion within the, the population, the repeated uh, observation of practices and their variation, the observation and conduct of semi-structured interview and life history. And second, I also mobilized the tool of and method of ethnoscience, including ethnobotany and ethnozoology. Uh, and so today, uh, then trying. Oh. Oh, which one? Are you pressing for this one? One? Mm -hmm. yeah. we just click on one, so let's click one again. Mouse and mouse and click one. Now, now we move on. Yes, the, that one, the second one. Second. Yes, thank you. So just to give me the, the plan. So drawing on my, and I will present my uh, elephant ethnography, I will first report on a set of uh, local practices as observed by the, the Mahout on the elephant health uh, with an elephant health specialist. And this observation you will see will highlight the similarities in human and elephant treatment, both in terms of, of ritual medicine, as well as in terms of uh, remedies medicine of plants uh, uh, medicine. Then based on this observation, on my observation on the elephant diet, I will focus on specific plants um, to forward that hypothesis that medicinal knowledge is also co-constructed and shared between human and elephant. So the, the, the conclusion indeed will try to highlight an open uh, discussion on the existence and the possibility of a multi-species system of medicine and care between human and elephant, which is a topic which is uh, at the center of the, the one else concern and all what the, the major issue we are, we are facing uh, currently. So let's let's start with the, my first part, the local knowledge on, on elephant. I, will, I won't be too, not too long. Yeah, in Laos, the, the, the village elephant benefits from a, a management and care system that involves the mahouts and the animal owner. And moreover, depending on the nature of the, on the symptom and control by the animal, they can call upon uh, the, some specialist called the Mo uh, in Laos, but more generally in Thai, in Thai language, the generic term Mo uh, refers to any person and though with specific talent, knowledge, power, in particular doctors, magicians, astrologers, or fortune tellers. So some of these specialists, uh, the, the Mo P, carry out their treatment via incantation or some mantra, and other specialists, the Moya, um, they will cure by the use of plants. Ya yeah, is the generic term for uh, plants in, uh, in Thai. And so in order to, to distinguish between these two aspects of the therapeutic treatment of elephant, I will shortly present uh, the, 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 the distinction of what I will call now uh, the ritual medicine performed by the Mopi and the remedies uh, medicine performed by the, by the Moya. I think one slide was before the song. No, before, before, I'm oh, sorry. Just one before? Oh, no, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Let me come up, I'm sorry, sorry, I just got confused now. Uh, yeah, that, that's right, that's right, all right. Uh, so I will just, and I won't be too long on this uh, ritual aspect, but the symbolic uh, treatment of human and, and animal is also part of the, uh, for me, is also part of the, ethnobotanical uh, research and what we're also doing in, in anthropology. So this is what we don't only focus on the, the plant effect, but we also focus on the, 
what the people believe and the meaning of what people are doing, just like uh, Mathieu was uh, saying, and the symbolic efficiencies of the ritual uh, make a lot of sense for the local. So this is uh, totally part of our uh, research in, in the botany also as anthropologists. So in, in, in Laos, uh, the, the everyday relationship between elephant and the mahout is highly ritualized. Uh, the local spirit called the pea are believed to be omnipresent and uh, in everyday life. And human, like elephant or any other animal, must be sure to live in harmony with them in their daily routine. And for example, in the, in the evening when the mahouts leave the elephant in the forest after a day walk, uh, he will inform, obviously, the, the spirit of the forest, the pipa, and the god of the soil and the, and the specific territory to inform about the presence. Of the, of the elephant for or the animal for the night, asking to taking care not to be bitten by snake or any bad evil, bad evil, etc. So this this ritual specialist is is, a, is part of the of the medicinal system of the elephant, and he will intervene through the life of the of the elephant. At the time of the capture of elephant, when the capture was still a practices in, uh, in Laos. He was there to ensure that the wild capture elephant will come to the village and will not bring some bad spirit within, within the, the, the village. At the time of the training also of the elephant, um, from the, uh, yeah, he will, he will also be, be, be present. Moreover, um, actually in, in Laos, uh, elephant, um, each elephant lives under a specific um, Household, and so it will be also protected by the household spirit, which is individual in each uh, household. And whenever an, an owner leaves his home for several days to work with the animal in the forest or for any other purpose, he has to inform the spirit of the host to ask protection for him and for the and for the, the animal. Uh, I just yeah, since we are on this no, we can keep it. <laughs> since we are on this slide, finally we'll reach it. Uh, this is on the occasion of the, of the new year, the Pima in, in Laos, and elephants celebrate the Basi, what we call the Basi ceremony. And this, this ceremony aims to gather the vital force or non endocrine present in, uh, in uh, each body part of the elephant. Something that we can find also in, uh, in India, in some, uh, in, some, in some places, that people believe that elephants are, have their own vital force in some spe specific a point. And this belief and the related ceremony concern human and it also concerns large mammals like elephant or buffalo. So, um, so I won't give you the full details, but it's a three step uh, ritual. The first step will be to chase evil spirit from the elephant bodies and to call and to gather the, the crown, the vital force within the whole elephant body parts. And then they will be tied with a, a white string on the hair and on the legs of the of the animal. You can try to move to the next to the next slide. <laughs> yes, like this. Thank you. Uh, and to get that, yeah, white string to the elephant here, feed and truck uh, to connect uh, to connect the the the, the squam. And um, and so interestingly, you can. Yeah, this Basi ceremony is very common, as I told, and uh, the, the, same, uh, the same ritual is also, uh, as I just said, the, the human also believe to possess those crowns, and this ceremony is also held for them. And so this last one, and this is just a brief introduction into the ritual life, daily life for the human elephant relation in terms of uh, health and well-being. It underlined that in Laos, there is a correspondence between the ritual treatment of human and elephant. But I will move to what might be more interesting for you now, the, the, the second aspect of the system of uh, health system for elephant, the, the medicine of the plants. So as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, in the village, the, the Moya, the plant specialist, heals people and animals with the help of remedies composed of plants. And regarding therapeutic practices of flowers, a famous French ethnobotanist, Jules Vidal, who conducted extensive botanical exploration in French Indochina, remind us that nine out of, of 10 of the substances used in the heart of healing are of plant origin. So Moya use a, a therapeutic codex. You have a picture of one of these called Timelaya, uh, literally the three trees on plants. 
And apart from elephant, uh, the receipt may apply to several animals, such as horses or buffalo. Each treaty, uh, just like what we have in Ayurveda for elephant, um, uh, like uh, Asti Ayurveda uh, or Gaja, uh, Gajandla Shintamoni, or many, I know there are many uh, codex or um, manuscript uh, dedicated to elephant. They will describe a set of composition of plants for the daily care with generally one or more variation if the first one does not work. Therefore, for example, basic uh, uh, composition to combat constipation, although if the animals have sore legs, blocked jaw, skin irritation, loss of appetite, and so on, uh, weakness or low blood pressure. And for, for example, to treat the, the yeah, so I, I won't give you the, I won't detail a specific one, I will just move uh, one. Because in the village of Benkiao, I collect and analyze a specific tamla, which include the preparation of what they call yabam long, literally the vitamin ball for elephant. And the preparation of the yabam long consists in a mixture of a dozen, according to some variation, different ingredients. So these this vitamin balls are prepared in large quantity, more than 40 balls at a time, filled in a big uh, rice uh, bag. And they are given to elephants, especially when they are involved in heavy work, such as logging operation that take place in forest for several days or even weeks. Uh, those vitamin balls are indispensable food supplement taken for the forest with all the working uh, equipment. And apart from this one that I just put here, they, are, they also have some uh, um, preparation for different purposes. Uh, for example, when the animal becomes too strong or when he will get enter into must, so to prevent the must, at the first sign of the must, when they see the floating, uh, they will uh, prevent and give some specific, um, specific preparation to calm them and, uh, and to, to weaken them, uh, called the MACFA. As an so as you can see, drawing on the immediate environment and taking into account the health condition of the animals, the Mahout from Laos, where I was working, have developed a unique form of ethno-veterinary knowledge and practices. However, while the information presented so far indicates a local system of care regarding the day-to-day -day primary needs of elephant, one aspect of this system includes, and I just mentioned in the introduction, the ability of the elephant to maintain the I request participants to please mute their uh, mic. I'm sorry, I, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the, and, uh, this, this will be my last part. Uh, by the exploration of the diet of elephant in situ uh, in the village and the surrounding forest, the following and last section will report on disability granted to elephant by the locals. To, to, to select and consume specific uh, plants on specific occasions. So we can move. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, so during field work, and, and maybe you can move again, please. Yeah, during, during field work, I explored the diet of Pachidan via the ethno-ethological approach as developed by a French anthropologist, Florent Brunois. And uh, according to, to her and what I, I, I adapted uh, the, uh, her work, access to the Pachyderm uh, so-called knowledge or, uh, on the environment and understanding in the environment is obtained through the Mahout mediation, particularly how they perceive the elephant behavior. So I first question the Mahout about the knowledge about the plants consumed by elephant and also went outing into the forest with them we are directly observe which species and which plant parts, roots, branch, fruits, leaf, liana, barks, elephants consumed by themselves. So fieldwork routing occur in the morning, accompanying the mahout as they went to fetch the animal or following the mahout and elephant doing their daily, daily activity. And so I will just present uh, some glimpse of it because as you know, uh, as a large uh, and biggest uh, mammal herbivore on, on hearts, on Earth, uh, elephant daily diet can weigh up to 250 kg of plant by day. So uh, they spend significant part of the day by eating or searching for food, and their diet varies considerably um, depending on the environment. So studying the elephant uh, diet is something huge. 
at, at the beginning. So my, my, but my examination at first allow me to highlight general information on, on the diet to not the important variation on the plant consumed through the year. The, there are some variation, for example, during the dry season and during the uh, rainy season. And uh, um, during the dry season, elephant consume more bamboo shoot and bananas. And the inter basic interpretation pro provided by the Mahout suggests that this ingredient contain large amount of water. And I, I actually, according to the Mahout, in the dry season, the Ladulang, elephants do not really have choice, but they eat what they found. This is not the case, obviously, during the rainy season. Uh, the Ladu found where the elephants are more choice and can diversify their diet. So at that period, the elephant prefer the leaves from a variety of bamboos put in during this period among eight varieties of bamboos. And during this period of uh, heavy falls, elephants eat less banana. They, they, they prefer the, the, the dog cry, the banana flower. It, it's interesting because when we visit elephant camp, we, we feed them with banana through the year, but actually it gives them some constipation according to, to Mahout. <laughs> so at first sight, indeed, it was difficult for, for the Mahout to list to me all the plants eaten by the animal, which could span uh, to uh, a thousand species in minimum, according to some. Nevertheless, some uh, who have a specific attachment with the uh, animal, and with whom I decided to conduct my field work, were able to distinguish Yes, yeah, to distinguish um, the, the plant taken as part of their diet as food called hahansa, and those uh, indicated as part of their medical diet call it uh, ya uh, So ya yeah is uh, is plant, qua is to cure, and sang is the elephant. So the plant to cure the, the elephant. And based on, on this first this distinction and categorization, um, I systematically uh, categorized type of symptom, the fatigue, diarrhea, digestive problem, injury, as well as the corresponding species the elephant was said to consume in order to maintain themselves in good health uh, condition. Uh, on that point, indeed, uh, the Mahouts who have accumulated knowledge about elephant feeding habits over generation and thus uh, have been able to be attentive to, uh, to the ingestion of in in unusual material, I just pointed out by a French uh, ethnobotanist and uh, ethnozoologist uh, Gillian Pujol in 1969. Uh, so I will just present two, uh, two specific uh, plants, that, uh, two specific plants that came back to me repeatedly because they caught my attention because the first will afford for the uh, hypothesis of uh, real practice for practices of self-medication for the first, and the second for a potential sharing of knowledge with human for the second. So the first of these plants uh, is a liana, uh, or wooden cleaning plant called uh, Juanamne, the Mukuna brilliant. And the owner was quite clear on the reason was, uh, why this, this elephant consumed this plant. Actually, this li liana is, uh, is available through the year, and it's a very common plant. But the, the, the owner um, has uh, um, remarked that uh, his elephant consumed this liana only once a year in December at the time of changing the season, and that he took only 10 bites of, of this plant. And interestingly, uh, because they also uh, uh, renting the elephant seasonally to work in a tourist camp and all, and uh, since, since he's walking there, he got some uh, deworming and junction, actually, when he walked in, in, in those elephant camps. And the owner noted that since he's, he has been walking there and, and has been being vaccinated uh, for deworming, he has no more seen his elephant taking along this, uh, this bike. So indeed, a rapid inquiry into the available literature highlights the fact that this Krenamna uh, has some deworming uh, in it. Um, so that was for the first example. We can move to the second one, the Mark Kunta. Um, the roots of this uh, plant uh, have indeed proven some um, virtue against uh, Jara. It's also a very common plant that we can easily find in, in uh, relevant literature. 
because several endobotical studies, and in particular, again, those of Jules Vidal for Indochina, suggest that the roots have antimicrobial, antioxidant, but also anti-malarial and anti-inflammatory properties. So interestingly, in a, in a village where I was, I was working, um, in uh, Banha, uh, former elephant owner, 82 years old, at the time of my uh, research, shared to me an interesting anecdote. He recalled that an, uh, an afternoon in the forest with his elephant, he, he noticed that the elephant belly was particularly swollen. And despite his, his command, uh, the elephant did not listen to him and didn't want to go back to the, to the straight back to the village. The elephant actually told me he seems to be looking for something in the, in the, in the forest, which he has found when he saw this makunta, small tree, because the elephant hit the root. Of, of this one. And at, at the moment, uh, before he found the, this Makunta, Chanti was not even able to climb and to sit on his elephant. The elephant does not allow him to, to sit on him. Uh, so soon after that, he collect this, uh, he hit this elephant root. Uh, Chanti re remind, uh, remember that his elephant was defecating a large quantity, more than usual. And when he returned to the village, the animal belly was no longer so swollen as appeared uh, healthy. So actually, Makunta is uh, well known uh, also to the Mahout and the, the, the Taino community I met during my survey. And on several occasions, the plant was mentioned as one of the remedies indeed given to the elephant in case of the area of this entry. But Mahout are also familiar with this Makunta uh, because they, they, um, they take the leaf of this trunk and boil it and take it as a herbal tea against uh, diarrhea. So here we also have the the connection. So I will just shift to my conclusion now. Um, so yeah, just to conclude and to recap, the, the ethnographic uh, survey revealed first the similarity in the ritual treatment of both human and animal, protection by the same domestic household spirit, but also uh, performing the same collective basi uh, ceremony. On the other hand, the collection of information on elephant diet reveal a possible convergence of plants used between humans and animals, such is the case regarding the Makunta. But indeed, if the animals take the roots and uh, take the plants as a row, the human, they have some techniques, make it balls, take the leaves, and transform the raw uh, material. Uh, and so again, I will quote this, uh, this uh, make, take a quotation from Hubert Gillet. Uh, from the National Museum of Natural in Paris, History in Paris, where we are also uh, working in, back in 1969, where he said um, about the human-animal cohabitation in feeding behavior of wild animals, it is possible that the observation made by some natives of the, on the occasional removal of certain barks from trees in the Africa savanna may have drawn their attention to these trees as medicinal plants. So indeed, from a local point of view, there is no doubt that elephants have knowledge about their environment. Mahouts and elephant owners were engaged on a daily basis with them, clearly understand the skills and capacity of elephants to mobilize what we can call an elephantine knowledge in a variety of situations. Uh, this is also the case, for example, again, at that time of the uh, elephant capture was still performed. As you know, it, it's performed with the use of a conkey. So conkey has also some knowledge of the forest and they help to go and capture another elephant. This is why I point in my, in my book, in just uh, this so that it's Kumar as the book here uh, in, in Northeast India. But let's just come back and finish in, in, in Laos. So to some, some extent, the Laosian human elephant system of medicine and care can be considered as one aspect of a multi-species uh, human animal culture. And yeah, and so maybe I would like just to, to finish and launch uh, maybe a discussion and probably what uh, elephant in this case, but most probably animal in general can remind us is that we indeed as human are not the sole repository of the knowledge when it comes to plants and biodiversity. And on the contrary, indeed, we must learn to collaborate with animals and consider them as a full co-producer of knowledge. Uh, in the case of elephant, the remaining elephant culture uh, present in South or Southeast Asia that have integrated 
already these aspects in their own society and knowledge represent a crucial starting point uh, to learn new way of living on this underdeveloped planet and to consider one, the health of human and animal in their living environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, maybe we can come to our come to this thing. So now uh, uh, I open for questions. You can on your mic and uh, you can uh, ask your questions if you have to both the Matthew and Nicholas. But tell the name of which question you want, so it will be easy for them to respond to. Yeah, only you want to take this forward the question answers and conclude. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, mm, I can. Yeah, so we will open for questions. Yeah. yeah. And just on your mic and then ask any questions that you want to know. Yeah, I have a question, Nicole. Why did you select uh, uh, allow as your field work area? What was the motivating factor? Oh, actually, you know, as you know, I, I did my PhD in, uh, in India, in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Um, and so just uh, I got this, uh, this opportunity to move to, to move to Laos for my first postdoc. And uh, I must say also that I, I did this uh, during my, my PhD field work was in, uh, in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, yeah, it was a bit uh, rough, I must, I must say. And so in that sense, the, 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 Laos, the Laosian context was probably more, uh, uh, how to say, <laughs> easier than uh, after my three years in Arunachal. That, that's why I just slowly shift to, to Laos. And uh, I, I naturally continue on the, on the elephant. And uh, as I told, I was, uh, uh, my book and PhD was more the capture and system of domestication of the human elephant in, in India. But then I shift to the to the health to the health issue, which was underrepresented in my in my in my PhD, and I really wanted to. I had this intuition indeed that the, the Mahouts learn a lot from the from the elephant. That's... Um, hi. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Divya Srinivasan. Yeah. Hi. So um, I was wondering, so most of the observed behavior and the knowledge imparting that happens between the mahout and the elephant is obviously from domesticated elephants. So they captive um, populations, right? So is this something that uh, the mahouts are also aware of that there may be some change in behavior and diet in terms of the elephant that is captive as opposed to the wild elephants and is that also that something that they factor in as part of the knowledge uh, imparting that happens or is is this something that they completely regard as part of elephant behavior as such i mean obviously there are social there are factors like social stress and um, ecological stress and those kind of things captive stress that might be influencing the elephant behavior in terms of diet choices as well so um is that something that mahouts are also you know is that a factor that they consider as part of understanding elephant behavior and knowledge and um trying to sort of you know sort of as part of the knowledge exchange that happens thank you yeah thank you yes you are right first the 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 research was conducted about uh, I don't use the term uh, captive elephant because this is not the term used by the local population. So they call them the, the, um, the village elephant, mm -hmm. the sound band. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and indeed, in, and indeed yeah, they, this is, they got it from this uh, village elephant. And, um, right. But indeed, I, uh, I, I got the, this is another subject actually, so I want, Dig much in this, I can I can uh, encourage you to, to to maybe to read my books or I can send you some documentation because the elephants they capture they, they do not capture a newborn elephant actually in the forest they right. capture five years old elephant actually and within right. this five year old uh, mm -hmm. those elephants already know the forest because he has been right. taught by its so called wild mother so mm -hmm. when they capture an elephant they will never capture a, a juvenile mm -hmm. one. 
-hmm. but they will capture an elephant that knows the forest, that already knows the forest, and that already right. spent time with wild ele right. elephants in the forest. In that sense, I will not say that there is no stress and no harm and no change, but living within the human in the village, but mm -hmm. it's it's kind of totally different. I'm not talking about zoo elephant or uh, yeah elephant born within a uh, human hand. Okay. And so this totally have some impact also on mm -hmm. the level of stress or etc. But but the reason behind this is also because those. Uh, Forest elephant, one forest elephant, bring it to the, the the village. They will also be able to help the human to go and capture right. another elephant, which is nowadays not into practice, but also right. to uh, to navigate into the forest with with the human, because an, an elephant born into the village will never go alone in the in the forest. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, no, those check on domestication. This question is for both of you. Uh, like, you have what kind of uh, difficulties and all you have faced? Like, because not all the people are willing to share their uh, traditional knowledge. This in, I have seen, like, they don't like to share, it's like, their community, they should be there with themselves only. So, what kind of uh, difficulties you have faced? Like, you said you were well in Gujarat and you were in uh, Natural Pradesh and so on, So, what kind of uh, and how you tackle it? Uh, good question. It's um, it takes time actually. Uh, it, this is what we call in ethnography. We call it this approach phases. You know, a stage in research. It's like you you have to through some first contact, go to get to know some people, and then build a trust relation. It takes hours of discussion, explaining what is the research just explaining what is research and then what is your own research on, you know, and uh, all these kinds. Uh, working with the Rabari uh, has been very difficult in the beginning uh, because also as they face a lot of trouble when they migrate, they tend to be very cautious with uh, any kind of people outside of these migration groups, outside of the community, but also outside of their own group. So it, it takes a lot of time and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, after spending three months in one village, for example, in Kutch, we were able, uh, with the one student who was with me for translation in the beginning, we were able to talk to, I don't know, 10% of the village to, with, to have actual real interviews. It's very long time. And we did also like this uh, prior informed consent in some cases, but not written, because written was associated to any kind of official documentation and so on. So, and people were not at ease with that. So we explained the research and recorded orally. Yeah, yeah. I will just say that in it, it takes three times, and this is also what we call the anthropologist uh, kitchen, how we approach people, how we gain the confidence. Uh, so yeah, for, 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 for the PhD in Arunacha, it was, uh, it, it took me a lot of time. Actually, I start from Kerala for my MSc and, and I finish my PhD in uh, Arunacha. So you can imagine I <laughs> come across all the, all over India. But I was lucky because I was, uh, I was inviting a lecture as I had IIT during that period. So it allowed me to, to move smoothly, but still the question of permit first to entry and then to have the contact. So, and in the PhD, we also, we also get the confidence of all the people. That means they share everything about the ritual, about the legal or illegal activity and everything. So we also have some responsibility. And this touch what Mathieu was speaking about the ethics mm -hmm. also and the relation, because people are really confident to us and they share everything. And we also foreigners who sometimes have to be initiated, we spend time, so we, 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 they deserve their voice to be rightly uh, resituated. And protected. and protected as well. So in the book, for example, because I'm dealing with some uh, elephant capture, all the names have been changed. So this is part of the... For this, but elephant thing, there was any ethical committee? Of course, we have in some institution and some ethical, uh, ethical uh, consent or ethical uh, committee to approve for the research. Otherwise, we cannot defend. Yeah. 
but, uh, but the, the, the biggest responsibility goes toward the local population. Do you want to take one more question? That question is done. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Peters had a question at a time when Western science is doubling down on its own, its hegemony on knowledge. What is the future of the idea that there is multiple ways of knowing? Sorry, I thought, thank you. Okay, Sorry. so yeah, I didn't get the. Yeah. What she is asking is at a time when Western science is doubling down on its hegemony on knowledge, what is the future of the idea that there is multiple ways of knowing? I think this future is bright. <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously, like, uh, because uh, there have been real advancements in the discussion about the potential role of uh, indigenous knowledge or the other ways of knowing besides the scientific one, okay? And um, I think this discussion is getting some strength and it's a good thing. Even if you look at the IPVS or the Nagoya Protocol, for example, or these kind of uh, institutional steps that have been taken that are good. Yeah, um, uh, of course, science becomes a, a hegemony, but it is, I mean, it has kind of always been since the 19th century, actually. And um, uh, I don't know, the situation is not so uh, negative. I think. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think, um, yeah, uh, we are hopeful, definitely. And IPCC and IPBS, if you look at Definitely, there is much more integration on multiple evidence base and so and so on. But there is still that hierarchy. So I think things are changing. But uh, yeah, we are hopeful. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. I noticed uh, that in your slide, uh, there was a mention of Dr. Marco Madeira. With the uh, archaeobotanists, right? Yeah. So, I want to know how much of your own knowledge, of your, of your uh, research findings, that are complemented from archaeological work. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I I've been working with uh, Mahmoud Madera for one project. Uh, I was doing a postdoc. Is it the same as Western Pakistan? <laughs> no, that they are currently no. Currently, they are working in Western Pakistan. Yeah. So before they were working in Gujarat, and they had a case study. And um, the idea, they actually hired me as a postdoc in one of their projects to study contemporary pastoralists to understand what was going on uh, before, no? In the transition past Neolithic and so on. Um, so it was complementary in a way that uh, I was able to um, help them to draw some, to narrow the hypothesis they were making about past societies and so on. But I was not able to give uh, definitive answers. So you mentioned something about politics of knowledge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do you feel that that is a major barrier towards conservation? About politics of knowledge, like okay. local knowledge and you said local to global knowledge. Is it politics that comes? Do you feel that that is sort of the barrier when it comes to? Conservation ventures or conservation initiatives. Yeah, part of it would be related to conservation issues and so on. Uh, I think the, the, most of the problems with conservation would come from the institutional uh, aims that are implemented and the politics, not of knowledge, but within the, 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 between the different actors in the institutions. Okay. But one part is also coming from the politics of knowledge. For example, um, during colonial times, the management of natural resources was only based on the Western countries' science. Okay, so people were applying what they studied about uh, French forest to um, Moroccan forest or to move. in India. It was the same, no, the, the policy for forest management. So. It has to, to see this, yeah, this politics of knowledge and so on. Um, 
Dr. Oni was talking about this multiple evidence uh, uh, system or option, like to, to put all knowledge, ways of, uh, of knowing at the same level. I think it's a very good uh, way of thinking about that. Um, so when you started, uh, you have to have to about the whole epistemology, the the uh, Thai people's understanding of the world, like uh, you mentioned uh, the Quan, the white mm. groups, and things like that. So how did you get started with? Because it's a complete, it's it's very spiritual, in way, right? So uh, have you like gone through their books? How did you understand their understanding of the world? No, we need uh, many way of doing uh, anthropology, and uh, we can indeed start from the books, all books, uh, sacred books. But uh, my way, and I think it's also Matthew's way, is just starting by observing what people are doing, what rituals they are doing, when, why, where, to which, and indeed after some connection, I need with us. But not to not to make them into competition, but just to understand again the meaning that people are giving to such and such practices and the sense they confer to to, to this. So this the I mean religion has been a big topic in anthropology. So we also enter into the field work by uh, studying and asking uh, the, the about, about, about the rituals. The the yeah ritual has to part of the daily life of uh, many people, especially in, uh, I don't know much in India because I, I haven't been working in India for some years now, but in, in Thailand, in Vietnam or in Laos, you know, any interaction with, the, with any plants or any forest also goes to the mediation of some rituals, of even a single plants to a immolation of animal also, but uh, so ritual, and this is actually what my communication also wanted to, to push that, uh, there's not only the, the efficient uh, botanic side, but behind this, they say a lot about the, the people, what people are thinking and practice uh, also, uh, linking the, the spiritual with the pragmatical things of the daily life. Yeah, so I don't know if it's uh, just, uh, just um, good example or not, but yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole and Matthew. There is one more question, sorry. To interrupt, what is the role of ethnobotany in cultural landscape conservation and regenerative development? Shall I repeat the question? Yeah, no, what no, is fine. the role of ethnobotany in cultural landscape conservation and regenerative development? Yeah, um, ethnobotany and more widely that like, uh, ethnoecology, for example, would have uh, definitely a role, an important role to play in this kind of things as a the, uh, the basic uh, thing to do for cultural landscape conservation would imply to understand the way the management of natural resources that is implemented by local people and the interactions of people with plants and so on. So yeah, of course, that would definitely be something. Yes, definitely. Okay, uh, Nicholas, okay. I have two questions for you. Shall I? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, you have worked uh, in Arunachal Pradesh as well as Thailand. Right now, you are working on uh, ethno veterinary medicine in relation to uh, elephant. Is there any literature you come across in uh, Thailand to say on uh, traditional practices literature, which can correlate between the knowledge system existing in the community to the literature side or vice versa? One question. Second is, uh, how do you validate these practices which are existing in the community for a better promotion of uh, this knowledge. So, yeah. thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, so, you, 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 yeah, your first question was linked to the existence of uh, literatures. Literatures. Yeah, yes. from Thailand or even from Arunachal Pradesh, mm -hmm. the geographical areas, I'm asking. Indeed. Um, yes, indeed. So, this also. Uh, the kind of big challenge indeed, because, and as you know, there's different uh, kind of valorization in knowledge in India. You have the right hand Brahmin knowledge, you have the, um, you have the, um, the engineer knowledge, like we can say, specialized knowledge, and you have what we can call uh, 
unknown, undocumented, unvalorized local knowledge. So you have at least- Oral tradition. Can call it traditional indeed. And so those kind of knowledge are really poorly documented. They are very far, no connection with the highly uh, uh, knowledge. And our work indeed is to document at first those knowledge, but as an anthropologist, we also have some uh, ethical responsibility and we are not also, here, and because we have also to protect it. So we are not also here only to push this knowledge at the forefront. So because we also, we also have some concern about what we do, about what people share and do. So, uh, but just trying to, yeah, to document because this knowledge is getting lost. This is the, because this is O'Reilly knowledge and uh, Mathieu was also uh, mentioning and, uh, transmitted from one generation to another by uh, O'Reilly or even without, the, without anything. If you remember this small uh, rubbery was learning by himself with, with the God. So uh, yeah, how can we define uh, to which extent are we authorized to uh, highlight this knowledge? So these are also kind of ethical questions we're putting. And uh, of course, we're trying to, uh, I found some manuscripts and I'm working also on some manuscripts in uh, in, uh, th that was in Thailand, and those manuscripts are written in, in Pali. So it's uh, the equivalent of Sanskrit here. Yeah. Even, so even for the local Mahout, he will not, he will not do anything with the, but okay, we'll consult the specialist, we'll learn from him, he will mix, he will make some kind of hybridization also. He will look at his elephants. So one interesting point is, and this is something I wanted to say, is that knowledge is always a dynamic and ongoing process. So it's uh, very difficult to, uh, block or to stop also uh, a knowledge. So yeah, these are some major concern and especially because we are working with those so-called unknown, unvalorized uh, knowledge also. And this is also, I believe, uh, and I'm sure Mathieu will share this part of the uh, res responsibility. And uh, maybe just to come to go back to what uh, Dr. Oni was saying about, uh, I think, and maybe due to the COVID now, we are no more in a vertical transmission of knowledge, but we are even more on an horizontal way of knowledge. So maybe that was what we're pointing on the multi-scaling uh, way of uh, transmitting and sharing. And we also have to be attentive also to the role of the uh, biodiversity and animals and to include them within this uh, local horizontally sharing knowledge. So this may be what, what I will say. And just briefly on the second question that I forgot, uh, how do you validate this knowledge ah, system yeah. and for promotion? Okay, so my, my answer, I think, was kind of in part of it. So, indeed, we have to be careful. We have to also uh, work on uh, our collaboration with uh, institutions, like I think they do what we're working, but indeed, we, are, we have some concern, and yeah, we, we that's. Um, that's the thing. But most important is indeed to work with uh, some uh, national institution also not to bring uh, the, the, this knowledge there. And that's why we, we, are, we are really uh, uh, hoping for fruitful collaboration here also. Because this might be your part of the job. You see, we, uh, this might be your part of the, of the job after all. the research, the result, uh, our publication, but then, okay. That's, that's, that's what the methodology for validation there. On, now we had, you are saying that we had to link with the national institutes for uh, doing this. Sure. If at all, if it is there. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. This kind of yeah. things are. Uh, yeah. Want to add something? Yeah, the term validation is uh, always uh, going back to the question of the politics of knowledge and so on. No, it's validating traditional knowledge through the lens of scientific knowledge, through the kind of sort of, um, I mean, it raises questions in terms of. Why, why should we validate at all? Yeah. Why do we need to validate? After all, yeah. we call the knowledge. Itself is a validation there. I mean, if we want to say that the knowledge of traditional people is not uh, uh, standing uh, or meeting the requirements of the advanced knowledge, then you can challenge that we have to validate. But then knowledge is knowledge. I mean, how do we say, how do we say that if uh, we, uh, we associate ourselves with an institution and then that knowledge will get validated? How do we say that the knowledge of the institution has got itself validated? I mean, it's a very tricky question. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is knowledge. They have been carrying no, on this true. knowledge for centuries together, and they've been working, they've been living, and living with much dignity as we are living now. 
But for me, personally, my experience of working with tribals and all these people is that their knowledge is immense. I mean, they, whatever knowledge they have got, they have, are, they have learned this with the nature. Uh, they have learned, not learned from a textbook, what we learned from textbook, but they have learned from the, they have heard from the horse's mouth, for that matter. So, uh, I don't know. But if you, if you want to convert that knowledge into some other knowledge, in its pure form, it's a knowledge, but if you want to convert that knowledge with something else, then it will, it will, uh, it will come into a separate form, which is not traditional knowledge. That knowledge you need to validate. That you have to validate, because that is not, that's lost, lost its original character. In the case of promotion, sir, then the validation is promote. Yeah, promote, promote. Yeah. See, promote See, the knowledge is getting promoted automatically. Are you going to say that the tribal I contacted about uh, 20, 30 years ago, that was the starting for the knowledge? No. The knowledge which I interacted with, knowledge which I got from the person whom I interacted 20 years ago, he must have got from 20 years ago from somebody. Somebody must have got from somebody. So it is getting promoted. Now, if you feel that promotion means only adding something else to that and then develop something else, that promotion is stupid. Motion is if the see just like vestigial organs in our body. If any organ is not useful, it dies down automatically. It get becomes vestigial organ. It's no use. Similarly, knowledge had that knowledge been not of any use, why it would have been there now in existence after centuries? Uh, yeah, centuries but there is the, it's there within that community. When we want to take from okay. out of the community, uh, to the other so community. You want, to convert, you want to convert that knowledge into something else which can be used in the larger, the larger communities. Yeah. That so that's where you to add to what you said. Mm -hmm. Again, again, to what Sir said, if you're taking traditional knowledge and using that knowledge, you, for example, using a plant to say uh, to form formulation which can be used for mass benefit, for that, if you're using it for a different population and you need validation or sort of certification, this will work for so that. that so that validation has a different meaning. That, that validation does not mean certification of that knowledge that that one is correct or not. No, mm -hmm. not that validation. No. Yeah. Can I can I intervene here? Yeah, yeah, only come. Uh, yeah. We are running out of time. Uh, uh, we are, uh, I think, 35 past uh, three. Yeah, yeah. 35 minutes past three. So, shall we continue or close the session? We can, uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, one or two will take and close now. Just getting late also. Yeah. Yeah, I think online uh, people are slowly, uh, slowly going yeah. away. So yeah. I will conclude the session, and then you can have an internal discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to highlight, uh, I think, uh, thank you, Matthew, Dr. Matthew and Dr. Nicole for this uh, wonderful session. I think this has highlighted multiple points. Uh, I, from Matthew, I think the main message was how uh, social organization and power structures um, decide variation in knowledge and uh, you don't we don't have a kind of a static entity as a knowledge system or anything it's very dynamic it's uh, uh, clearly changing and adapting to the changing environment and that also led to your second point like uh, you mentioned uh, a very critical point that ecosystems are changing the 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 cultural organizations are changing the social organization is changing that's also leading to large scale change in the uh, traditional ecological knowledge that was uh, from matthew what i understood uh, you also highlighted the politics of knowledge which is i think very critical issue uh, from nicole uh, i mean thank you for sharing this understanding of co-creation of knowledge and i think uh, what a shared meaning that communities um, have on uh, whether it is symbolic um, aspects or actually really tangible elements. So you highlighted uh, through examples of Yapu uh, Agzan, how uh, even animals can indicate uh, what is probably uh, good for healing and health and so on. So co-creation of knowledge and extending uh, this anthropocentric view to a kind of more um, planetary centric view of uh, thing. That's what you highlighted. And uh, I think um, I would just uh, try to highlight three uh, strategic uh, points out of this webinar, which is wonderful, which has highlighted so many dimensions of expanding ethnobotany. The first point being that I think the, uh, especially in India, the biocultural lens 
of understanding of knowledge through this ethnographic, uh, ethnographic and biocultural lens has not been so much highlighted in ethnobotany. And I think that needs a clear attention. That is a first message. The second message is that, uh, uh, and you were discussing that the validation, the terms that we use in, uh, in uh, creating evidence base for the knowledge. And I think uh, in TDU, we have been very carefully using the term assessment, not validation, because there are multiple ways of uh, knowing. There are multiple meanings uh, attached to this knowledge in different communities. So uh, there are, uh, as uh, Professor Atul mentioned, there are internal methods of validation. Otherwise, why at all it exists in the community uh, after uh, so long? Uh, period of intergenerational transfer. So it's important to understand this and appreciate this. When we started the documentation assessment program, we had tried to do this anthropological lens of uh, being very sensitive to both the content and the ethical dimensions of uh, knowledge and uh, who, who has the right to own that knowledge and so on. So I think we need more and more capacity building through our academic programs to look at this, I mean, the ethnographic lens very carefully and applying it in ethnobotany. That is the second part. The third and the last point, I think uh, both Nicole and Matthew come from uh, uh, from the CNR system and uh, the uh, French research institution. So it clearly also points to the collaborative research and networking that we need to do. And I think uh, those three points I wanted to highlight. So thank you all for this very interesting session, and we'll continue this as a dialogue. So uh, with that, I hand over to Dr. Karim to uh, thank and close and thank, the session. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Thank you very much uh, for concluding the session. So I think nothing more. I really thank all the participants and uh, both uh, Matthew and Nicole for spending the time uh, within this, I mean, frame that we have come to India, especially Nicole. And uh, he's living now in two, two days. Two days. Two days he's living to France. <laughs> so uh, I thank and Matthew, our well wisher from the start. And uh, he helps us, our students, and our research uh, uh, ideas, which he puts in uh, the anthropological point he puts into the students of uh, mostly our conservation practice students. And see that all the papers are adding the value of anthropology whenever they go for a documentation. That part is uh, certainly putting that in the mind of the students to understand the other science. So I thank you, Matthew, for uh, coming here and doing this. And thank you, everyone, all my colleagues. Really. Thank you very much. Yeah. Close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.